Yeah, yeah, I want to record it because I think it's very important. Okay, I think it's very important. So we'll have uh, the uncertainty of, uh, this is the embodiment of uncertainty. Okay, the markets are the embodiment of uncertainty. Now they're so uncertain that we're not even getting the data. Okay, but um, the point is, the point I want to emphasize is that you should see in response to your thing, what I said was about a, uh, your duty as a student is to uh, is to study, okay, to be focused on your study. So you don't should not think about your own personal, what you feel like doing. So as a, as a general principle, I would suggest that if everybody here, nobody is under any illusion that life is a bed of roses. It's not going to be a bed of roses for anybody, no matter how wealthy you are. There is, uh, fate does not spare anyone. So our goal is to prepare as teachers, we should prepare you to deal with the tough times, right? Good times, nobody needs to be trained for. So so the point I'm trying to make, make here is that you should develop this way of thinking about everything in you should your sense of duty has to come first okay luckily that's already a part of our culture okay which is uh, so one of the good things about our culture so you sh if you don't train yourself to think like this I'm telling you you're going to get into trouble later on because uh, all kinds of things can happen in life although in Hindi we say shub shub bolo but the, we should not sugarcoat things <coughs> we should not sugarcoat things and give you a false sense of security that life is a bed of roses right so things are going to get difficult if if you don't develop this way of thinking about things, you should be primarily driven always by a sense of duty. Okay, your duty to your parents and then you should think about yourself uh, as when you think about yourself, this I already covered in lab. In your lab notes, you have this idea already embedded. Okay, that you are, I'll just put it here once again, this is a very important point. We are losing the connection here. But the point is that the very important point, please make sure you understand. Okay, that uh, what we are trying to make here. I can't even write. So uh, the point is that you have to, I've covered this in lab, that you have to think of yourself as a trustee of your talent. You understand what a trustee is? Okay, like you have Tata Trust, so you, you have certain trustees in the Tata Trust. Yes, sir. Okay, so the trustee, there's a concept of in trust law. Law of trust is a domain of the law. Okay, so it's very common. So a rich person like say uh, Ray Dalio might set up a trust for his children and he will appoint a trustee. Say Rajan is the trustee for the trust for Ray, where the beneficiary, there's a beneficiary. Okay, so the beneficiary is Ray Dalio's children and the trustee is Rajan. Okay, so his job is to navigate or manage the assets of the trust so he'll put some money into the trust your job is to manage the assets in the trust for the benefit of the beneficiary not for your own benefit okay you are put there for a reason okay to manage it for the benefit of your so so i think i i think it's just very important to see your your role in life first is your duty to your parents and then you have a duty to your own talent okay if you don't approach it in this way you're going to have get into trouble no matter how wealthy you are you're going to get into trouble you have to see your the purpose of your life is to basically give expression to your talent remember I gave you a line from the English poet Stephen Spender that the goal the purpose of uh, I think what, what the purpose of every man uh, every man's purpose is to fulfill his potential every man's duty to the universe to is to fulfill his potential okay if you don't see it like that I'm telling you this is the essence of life if you don't see it like this you're going to get into trouble okay so you have to see that your you have your potential the potential is the beneficiary your potential or your talent is the beneficiary and you are the trustee of your talent are you following what I'm saying yes. if you don't approach things like this what will happen is if when bad times strike because we are all emotional creatures things may get very bad and they may stay very bad for a long period of that's how life works okay if you are not equipped with this sense of duty that my duty is to you know give uh, expression to my talent that I'm, I have a duty to if you are not imbued with this sense of duty you will not be able to stand in the face of all the problems that life can throw at you things can get very bad so you have to be driven by a pri primarily by a sense of duty if you have a sense of duty that is a higher calling that will enable you to stand in the face of all kinds of problems you understand what i'm saying you get the message because if you are completely driven by oh what do i like what do i not like my emotional requirements okay i don't want to come to college on a thursday or on a wednesday afternoon you have to be driven right now your main duty is to your parents always and then to your uh, your talent and your role right now is a student okay we have this concept of duty fair, very firmly in our culture everyone should understand like what did krishna tell arjuna it's your duty your duty is to fight the war okay not worry about the consequences or how you feel or whatever this is clear it's a very important thing it has no relation to i mean uh, so some of you may take it lightly but i'm telling you this you, you should, should remember this it will help you in your la uh, later on in life because nobody knows what's going to happen to anyone right so you have to be prepared for the tough times now what are we going to do when there's no connection let's try the geo 
but the geo also may not okay so did that make sense what I told you or you think just this old man is uh, talking too much okay it's a very important and the other point also which is a, a very important remember you should remember two things all this uh, few things that I told you you're that you're the trustee of your talent okay so it's like you are not one person you are split into two there is your talent and then there is your emotional side okay so you have to always remember that yes you have to pander to your emotions yes but you also have a duty to uh, fully exploit your, your own talent okay and that's the only thing that matters in life really no, no matter how much money you have you will not have satisfaction you see all these rich kids these uh, Robert Downey then uh, Robert Downey jr. the guy who played Sherlock Holmes and all they're all drug they have all kinds of drug problems Ben Affleck and all is continuously going in and out of you know Ben Affleck yes. he's continually he has no shortage of money okay so uh, he is continuously coming in and out of rehab. He's an alcoholic. Why? I mean, he's not happy because he's not happy, right? So money alone doesn't buy. You need to have a sense of purpose, and you, if you if you give uh, see things in this way, you will always be able to stand no matter how tough the uh, the winds are. Okay. Okay. All right. So we we'll leave this here. So thanks. Uh, thankfully, this has come back. Okay. So this. So now we're going to continue with the case. So basically, that's what you need. Uh, the other point is, the uh, everything that happens to you reflects your mindset. You should actually put it up on your wall. It's some. You should think about it every day until the whole thing hits you. Okay. Some. It, there's, there's two levels of understanding. Once you see, okay, in the Gita it says that you should do your duty and don't worry about the consequences. You read it on a rational level. But one day maybe you'll understand something will happen. You'll really understand like somebody punched you in the stomach. You'll really understand the meaning of that statement. Okay. That happens in two, uh, at two levels. Okay. So you should put this on your wall saying that everything that happens to you reflects your mindset. And you should think about how the things that are happening in your life are reflecting your mindset. Okay. Keep on thinking and then one day you'll just get it. You understand what I'm saying? You'll have an epiphany. Like aha moment. You understand it finally. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's start with the case. We have a lot of work to do. Those of you who missed the class, please read what we have done yesterday. All right. Okay. So we have, as I said, this is already in your notes. You'll find it. And I'll just move this. I can move it right in front of you here. But we, I'll do it after the class. I'll move it. It's all going to come into your notes. You don't need to write any of this. These are all S means it's in your notes. Okay. So this is our case, which we are going to do now. Now we have to understand this is a slightly unusual case because uh, this is a slightly unusual case because uh, it's a long case in the sense we can actually spend an entire course on this case, on the learning from this case. Yeah. So let's understand. Uh, what is going on here so this is magma resources a natural resources company okay so uh, it's a natural resources company so you see this we have a stylized balance sheet which means basically not everything is shown only certain key things are shown okay I've plucked out certain key aspects of the balance sheet all right okay so the assets are on and the asset side you have inventories and on the liability side you have loans okay all these things and this is why this is so th this basically puts you in the situation you're the new treasurer okay and the CEO is asking you for help with certain um, uh, questions okay so you'll have to answer these questions and this is where the learning is in this case all right which is here okay magma's underlying positions generic decision problems also we'll have to cover so as you answer these questions to answer these questions you'll have to acquire certain types of knowledge okay so that is what we'll cover first okay all right so let's go through the uh, balance sheet once again for the benefit of those who have not uh, have you ever under understood the scheme it's a stylized balance sheet you are the treasurer and the, uh, the CEO is asking you for certain question uh, asking you certain questions so now we go to the balance sheet all right okay this is too big now I think we should make it a little smaller all right okay now uh, like right so now look at this it's not very pretty actually because of uh, you know formatting problems with uh, the spreadsheet but on this side you have the assets maybe I should have put the assets and the liabilities in different colors but I think it'll mess up the these colors here so you can see the difference now I'll just put a little uh, set of uh, colors here in between so that uh, we can uh, differentiate between the assets and liabilities maybe we'll put some green or something like that yeah now you're able to see clearly assets and liabilities okay so the way of this the manner of display is these are the position sizes 2500 ounces of troy ounces of gold okay then 625,000 pounds of copper this is to go out a little bit all right 
then 25,000 barrels of oil. Okay, so the asset side, you can see it's a stylized balance sheet because we don't have fixed assets, we don't have uh, cash, we don't have accounts receivable, we have only shown inventories on the asset sides. Okay, so this is a company that is mining, that is uh, you know exploring oil, mining copper and gold. Okay, so these are their inventories. Okay, and uh, on the liability side you have uh, basically you have the broad split which i told you to yesterday we discussed so the broad split on the liability side should always be net worth and this all this entire block when i highlight can you see it are you guys able to see how is sg1 able to see you're able to see okay all right so um so the blue is too blue. Yes, okay. That means I was very sad. I was very sad when I was doing it. So it's too. Okay. Now we have to make it light blue. Come on, man. Now we'll try to put a very light color. Some kind of very light color. Pink. Yeah, yeah. Light pink has already been used somewhere else. Uh, let's use this. Let's see this. Is it better? Okay. So we are using this. We still have the blue. Okay. But we are not so sad. Okay. So now let's um, let's work with the liabilities now. Okay. Everyone is clear about the asset side. So the scheme here. Let me show you. These are the market prices. These are the market prices here okay and these are the quantities and these are the dollar values these are the market values in dollars so 625,000 pounds of copper at the rate of 2.649 per pound okay is equal uh, equals 1.65 1.65 1.66 million is this clear okay this is the schema here all right so now on this side you have the loan uh, you have okay the broad split is is net worth and outside liabilities we are repeating what we discussed yesterday all right net worth and outside liabilities that's how you should look at any balance sheet you have net worth on one side and uh, 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 net worth and outside liabilities and these are split into three loans yen loan aussie loan and uh, dollar loan okay i'm repeating some of the stuff that for the benefit of those who are not present okay so these are the amounts so this is the yen amount of the loan this is the Aussie amount of the loan okay and this is the dollar amount of the loan now the position sizes are very small because uh, I have to accommodate the fact that uh, the IB account only gives you one million dollars of equity so we have to leave room for initial margin plus when you trade this when you manage this risk on the balance sheet okay uh, you will also have losses possibly so the losses also have to be covered by that one million dollars of balance so therefore I was forced to make the uh, position size the balance sheet is very small 6.7 million dollars a very small balance sheet but you should not worry about the position size because even when you go to a manage a multi-billion dollar balance sheet the principles that you learn will not change one bit okay the theory remains exactly the same it's just that you'll be dealing with bigger numbers so even if you're managing a hundred thousand dollar loan and asking the question about whether or not this floating rate loan should be swapped into fixed nothing changes in terms of the theory that you learn when you go on to deal with bigger loans is that clear so don't worry about this this is because of the constraints of the IB uh, balance okay right now this is again the market this is the yen value of the loan this is the dollar value of the loan okay I should not use this book cursor because so many comments so this is the yen value of the loan this is the dollar value of the loan everything here is dollar value dollar value of the Aussie loan okay and uh, dollar value of the this is the dollar value this is the same okay dollar value of the dollar loan all right and here you have the net worth okay so the split is basically all these three put together is the outside liabilities and this is the net worth outside liabilities plus net worth equals your total liabilities equals total assets okay net worth is a residual concept you remember from our Solomon and Solomon company discussion okay so total assets minus outside liabilities if the value of total assets falls okay then net worth will fall Cetrus paribus net worth will fall if the value of total liabilities rises again set par net worth will fall yes and opposites okay so you should have this broad schema in your head because in India we use a lot of terms like reserves and surplus share capital but you should not lose sight of the fact that all that put together is net worth basically all your retained earnings paid up share capital everything put together everything that belongs to the equity shareholders can be called net worth 
okay so now so we did some exercises yesterday to show what the problems are let's look at the first question okay um, what is the first question what are the key risk factors okay so this scheme is so far everybody anybody any confusion because I'm going a little quick especially for those who were not present yesterday any questions any confusion yes Sakshi you were not there yesterday so far you're clear okay all right so let's look at the first question what are the key risk factors this is a term that you're learning okay what is a key risk factor when you look at any kind of uh, uh, asset any any kind of uh, book okay actually i should have covered a, a concept before that let me just go back a little bit i was so desperate I, i'm so afraid that i'm running behind on the case coverage that i am uh, rushing into this <laughs> one minute so uh, let's bring this here what happened sg1 is uh, in a good mood today <laughs> okay this one what okay so this all this will go into your um, so let me just put it uh, what is this technical note on what swaps okay so we can put all of this in actually so what I'll do is I'll straight away move this uh, into your notes folder uh, or I'll just make it into the put it into the students folder so you have a separate um, folder for the case okay so the case folder is now gone into this so the balance sheet is in your folder the note on the case which I'm showing you that the case description itself with the questions that's in their folder and then we have the technical notes so this is a little bit different from what you have studied in the past as cases right you have certain studied short cases usually one or two sessions okay so this case is a very long case but it's also structure uh, the structure is also different this this case is basically you have these technical notes can you see the technical note here okay so this case has three technical notes all right a technical note is something that comes before a case usually you see it in a finance case or an operations case the technical note is before the case okay after that comes the actual case which is this stuff here okay where you're reading the case and looking at the decision problem and the questions in the case that is the case proper and the case obviously here when it says figure one what this figure one is basically is this thing okay the figure one is this thing we can actually just take um, and link it to figure one so you can launch it from here all right so this figure one is basically the spreadsheet the stylized balance sheet all right so the balance sheet together with the questions in the case this part of the case this is the case this is the second part so the first part is the three technical notes all right then you have the case proper okay which is the body of the case which you are used to seeing you're seeing used to seeing the cases and then you have the third part is this project is where you will actually have to manage the hedge book okay so which is not really given in the case the case is for the discussion of the conceptual uh, principles which you will apply in actually managing the risk book that's your project okay so you'll have to manage the hedge book okay so essentially what we will call this is the passive risk book this this particular company's balance sheet is a passive risk book and what you have managed so far are active risk books basically passive risk books are what you have in, in the case of hedgers okay and active risk books are what you have in the case of speculators now these concepts are all laid out in your notes okay so you can just read the notes that's why I said before we go into this uh, thing I need to go through the technical note with you all right let's look at te technical note number one yeah this is the first you should first study this technical note okay and here you will find that certain concepts are a little old for you you've already covered base asset terms asset but because it needs to be a comprehensive note is the font big enough yeah. last bench yes. okay so because you because the note needs to be comprehensive so many of these things are covered again so you can just skip these things okay base asset terms asset you already know transaction settlement you know position exposure also you've been ta taught okay so these things we don't need to worry about players in financial markets also you've been taught because in order to discuss corporate treasury risk management in order to discuss hedging we need to have clear ideas about what are speculators what are hedgers okay so first position reducing the total risk and now you'll understand why I mentioned total risk okay in the case of a speculator it's not so the, the trading book itself is the total risk but in the case of a hedger you will have the underlying position and the hedge position okay they're sitting on top of each other they don't disturb each other okay so it's like two levels in an airport you have an underlying position and you have the hedge position so the total risk is basically the sum of the two positions the risk on the sum of the two positions so you'll see how that happens so that's why I mentioned when at the definition I mentioned total risk this is clear okay so this stuff all this is 
is in your notes so you don't have to take notes so we'll just quickly go through where do we need to go players in financial markets risk definitions and taxonomy also we have done risk books let's go straight to risk books because I was using this uh, yeah so you can go straight to this is actually written as uh, with you have these chapter links uh, section links so you can go directly to that okay now essentially now there's a lot of language here you can read this is meant for your theoretical definition okay of a risk book but essentially a risk book you're already familiar with an active risk book okay so in the industry the commonly used term is for for any trading book they use the word risk book okay so when you're interviewing for a position in say uh, any kind of a finance role especially uh, on the market side okay you remember that I've told you about three types of roles in, on the on the market making side you have trading sales and research the skill sets are all different okay so if you're a trader you have a feeling for now what is involved in trading because you'll be taking positions you'll be losing money then you'll be biting your fingernails figuring out trying to decide whether you should cut your losses now and eat the loss or whether you should wait for it to come back maybe it'll get smaller but then it may not come back it may get bigger okay then you bite off all your nails so all this problem happens so this this there's no solution to this problem this problem is never going to uh, get solved no matter what model you use this problem is never going to get for solved so you will have to figure out your own way so it's a very unstructured environment in trading okay so this not everybody has an appetite for this so you have to figure out whether it's something that you want to do okay when it's in research one of the advantages of research is that you don't have to deal with this kind of problem because you're not managing positions you're just giving views on the market okay so the research and trading there's a difference the trader also has to think like a researcher to some extent okay but he does not have to take positions i mean the researcher does not have to take positions okay so uh, so in the in the industry what they say is any trading book that they look at they would say is a risk book okay that is a term now we are making an additional distinction we are saying that when you were trading this stuff or you know you were trading say let's say you options on amazon facebook microsoft when you're trading them in your second project when you're trading your equity options you are so we are calling we are making a further distinction between the risk books run by <laughs> speculators and the ones run by hedgers because there are some important differences in terms of the decision problems that are automatically solved and how you operate okay in trade in in running an active risk book which is a speculators book okay you operate in a certain way certain principles okay and in running a passive risk book which we will define as the one that is run by hedgers okay so these definitions are all given here okay you can see here we have defined uh, under risk after risk book we have defined active versus passive risk books okay so the definition all given here I'll just explain it I'm not going to go through every line here you read it later on but here basically this is the distinction you already understand the difference between um, uh, a, a speculator and a hedger and you understand what a trading book is so in the industry normally when you look at any trading book that you're running whether you're running euro dollar futures whether you're running dollar yen or whether you're running uh, Amazon equity options okay any kind of trading book which a market maker or a, a directional speculator is running is referred to in the industry as a risk book so we are making a further distinction we are referring to the speculative risk books as active risk books because active because you have chosen to take that risk you started out with one million dollars in your IB account there was no compulsion on you to do any trade as such okay in the uh, in the in the in the real world you should not feel compulsion any compulsion to do a trade you should wait for the right opportunity okay so you are actively taking risk because you start with zero risk and then you increase your risk in order to make money so you're actively taking risk there is no real uh, risk being dumped on you from uh, above okay it's you're actively taking risk so we can call it an active risk book which is a speculators book so it'll have all the characteristics of a speculators book which is you the first transaction will increase the total risk okay in the case of a speculators book he can also open a hedge book okay so we can always think of a total risk as uh, the tra uh, the the underlying position risk plus the total uh, the hedge position risk Risk, okay so all these terms are defined in your notes so you don't have to worry about that but uh, the point is that uh, the uh, the tot the first transaction for a speculator will always increase the total risk okay but in the case of a hedger the first transaction must always reduce the total risk okay but that is the classical way so obviously you can sit in a hedging situation you can sit in a corporate treasury of a of a company and you can do what you're not supposed to do you might actually end up speculating this has happened in many companies I believe it happened in some of the Indian 
Indian IT companies also that people were not managing their foreign exchange risks in a systematic manner. So what we are discussing is the, what are the rules and what are the pro what is the proper way of doing it. But in practice, there is nothing to prevent a human being who can, who has been given authority. He can always abuse that authority and do uh, things which he is not supposed to do. So that is always possible. But we are talking about what you should be doing if you are going to act as a hedger and not as a speculator. Okay. So in the case of a hedger, the first transaction was always reduce the total risk. Okay. So let's just go through some of these definitions. Okay. These are very long. I mean, that's why I'm explaining it to you. This is just for your reference to read, uh, you know, like a book, you can see the reference if you want to read up a little bit more. Okay. But the point here is that a risk book is any kind of balance sheet where there is risk. Okay. So here's an example of a risk book. Okay. Where basically, you know, there, there is a frequent change in some of the uh, assets and liabilities. Okay. In the price of assets and liabilities so this is an example of a risk book when you go here where the spreadsheet here right this is an example of a risk book because what happens if the price of oil falls let's see what happens always keep your eye on the net worth remember the basic rule okay uh, liability side is net worth plus outside liabilities and the equation is total assets minus outside liabilities equals net worth so if total assets falls or out to outside liabilities value rises both cases it will reduce your risk net worth okay and since we are talking about risk management we are always always focused on the downside when we are making money there's no problem okay we're all happy so uh, the point is basically to manage the downside so we are concerned about what makes the net worth go down a drop in value of total assets or a rise in the value of outside liabilities either of these will make the net worth drop okay all right so let's look at what happens why is this a risk book let's make the oil price drop to uh, every Indian should like seeing the oil price drop so let's really drop the oil price to maybe forty dollars what happened to the net worth 2.09 it came down to 1.6 you saw that yes Sukriti did not see it <laughs> What happened? Did the network go down? You saw it. Should we do it once again? So I should do what? Control Z and then I'll do Control Y. Okay. So notice the total assets. Now notice the size. In certain circumstances, the balance sheet will expand or contract and in certain circumstances, it will not. Okay. So notice that also. So notice the size of the balance sheet. Okay. And so for that, you can just look at either assets or liabilities, total assets or total liabilities. That will give you the size of the balance sheet. Okay. And also then look at the impact on the net worth. Okay. So we are going to make the oil price drop from 57.93 to let's say we make it drop to $40. So the total assets right now is 6.7 and the net worth is 2.09. So we're going to make it drop to $40. Okay. So what happens? Total balance sheet size shrinks. Okay and net worth also shrinks yes you can see this so this is the risk book so when you are talking about uh, uh, you know risk you are talking about the impact on net worth basically that's what you're so here you always imagine that you are continuously cal calculating the and recalculating from moment to moment you are calculating and recalculating the net worth i mean the entire balance sheet okay you're recalculating it moment to moment okay so you can see you have already seen how dramatically oil prices can move you can see here itself with that right now we are not even in proper active trading hours because Europe also has not come okay so uh, this is just Singapore Hong Kong time so you can see here then even then the oil price might move okay so you've seen how dramatically the oil price can move and any any kind of movement can have an impact especially if the in this case if the oil price drops okay there is a negative impact on net worth this is clear okay so one of the things we would say we are trying to understand the first question okay so so we are trying to understand basically why is this a risk book okay this is an example of a risk book because it contains assets and liabilities okay whose prices are uh, changing quite frequently okay so there are basically like market prices here as you can see they are changing quite frequently okay uh, they are not like we would not say that a company which has let's say if you have a balance sheet which is only on the asset side there's a nuclear plant okay 
and on the liability side there's only owner's equity there's no debt let's assume okay like bill gates was they have already built a next generation nuclear plant in china okay so uh, which they're now having uh, problems with because of the us china conflict so uh, now they built a suppose it was totally funded with equity no debt so that balance sheet for bill gates gates is nuclear plant in china on the asset side again we draw a stylized balance sheet is only a nuclear plant on the asset side and on the liability side there's only owner's equity is this clear are you following is it too abstract should we just do it on a spreadsheet or something okay so now that we would not call a, a risk book that we would not call a risk book although technically <coughs> the nuclear plant also is not something whose value is constant after 10 years the check technology has changed so the value of this nuclear plant which you built 10 years ago may not remain the same you may have built it for 100 million dollars but today's market it may be worth only 60 million dollars so the values of nuclear plants also change okay uh, but we don't call that a risk book because we are talking really about things which are like market prices which change very frequently are you following so this is a risk book only because it's got assets liabilities which are changing very frequently like uh, gold is also actively traded copper is also actively traded okay uh, oil is actively traded okay, so we should make it con we should now go back to make it control z okay oil is actively traded on this side also you have problems on this side because you have uh, remember one of the things which is stated in the case is that the revenues are in dollars only okay so we discussed this point yesterday whenever you have any kind of mismatch between your revenues and us dollars and the uh, the liabilities are in in other currencies okay so you're only earning in us dollars now if the yen strengthens against the us dollar you're going to have a problem because the yen amount on the liability is not going to change the yen lender is not going to accept a reduction in the loan amount of the of the yen that you have to pay back the yen principle is not going to change but if the yen strengthened against uh, strengthens against the dollar if you look at it here all right so if we make this usd jpy All right. So, any case of like this, when it goes, when the dollar yen goes from here to here, the dollar is weakening, and the yen is strengthening. So, make sure that your concepts here are very clear. We have already covered this while doing charts. The instant you look at a chart, you should be able to clearly see what is strengthening and what is weakening. Okay, you should be very clear. So, in this case, the base asset is U.S. dollars. The base asset goes down. That means the uh, when the chart goes down, the base asset is getting weaker, and then the terms asset yen is getting stronger. So, any situation like this, when a dollar used to buy 125 yen and from then it changes and the dollar is now buying only 100 yen you're going to have a problem because you've got a fixed amount of yen to repay and you're earning only in us dollars now so now it's costing you more us dollars for each unit of yen for each yen it's costing you more us dollars because each us dollar is buying less yen it's gone from dollar yen has gone from 125 to 100 is everyone following if the dollar yen drops from 125 to 100 that means the the yen is strengthened yes so then you have a problem because your assets are in us dollars okay although assets is the balance sheet concept and uh, we have said revenues are in us dollars us revenues are a pnl concept so revenues are a flow concept assets are a stock concept okay but you can imagine that if you have uh, again you are instantaneously if you are doing all your sales in cash okay and you're computing the balance sheet instantly uh, instantaneously so your cash will pile up on the balance sheet from your cash sales all your sales so you can actually make that conversion so if you're selling in, if your revenues are in us dollars it's effectively like having assets in us dollars so that's what we say is this clear so please make sure you're thinking about these things is clear if any statement i've made now is not clear to you please make sure you ask questions ritesh you're following yes, okay everything that i say you should be able to understand every sentence nothing like i understood a little bit okay you should understand every word that i'm uttering if you don't understand any word that i'm uttering you should ask a question this is clear all right so now we are trying to understand why what is a risk book okay yeah no depends on what your inventory is 
if your inventory is i don't know what maybe we can think of something certainly one on the other side let's say these kind of inventories are definitely going to change regularly because your inventories are all actively traded commodities so their values are changing so if the oil price drops from 5793 to 40 dollars do you think when your accounting period comes up do you think your auditor is going to accept an inventory valuation at 5793 for the oil price he will say you take a charge okay he will say you write down the value of your assets so the entry you will pass is basically you will debit you will uh, credit the uh, oil account okay the value of oil this will have to go down from 57 when this goes down from 50 is everyone following this yes. please make sure your uh, accounting is also very clear double entry bookkeeping journal entries everyone should be clear before you get out of business school okay this is one of the things you should be very very clear about whether you come from a commerce background or not it's very important to understand journal entries for any transaction okay in this case that if the oil price drops from 5793 to 40 dollars and now your accounting period has come again do you think your accountant is allow going to allow you to value the oil inventory at to 25000 barrels at at 1.448 no he will say no the market price is now much lower so you mark down the value of your inventory you take a charge so you will credit this balance okay to whatever the difference is between 5793 and 48 uh, and 40 dollars into this amount that amount of the loss you will have to credit this balance and you have to debit your pnl that will record a loss in the pnl is this clear right then later on you can convert again close that account into the net worth it will reduce your net worth okay so you will credit that and debit this okay uh, everyone following what i'm saying yes please make sure these are 100 percent clear okay your job is to get con concepts clear your job is not to pass exams whether you get b plus or c minus no one really gives a damn but what people give a damn about is how confidently you speak when you are uh, asked a question and that confidence can't you can't fake it you have to uh, the confidence comes from actual study and knowledge okay so that is what people really matters okay so you will be sized up when you're talking to somebody people will size you up in five minutes so you have to impress people within the first five minutes all right okay so please make sure your concepts are 100 percent clear okay so now you understood why this is a risk book this leads eventually to a reduction in net worth okay movement so coming back to mehak's question one part of the answer to your question certainly these so your statement is not true universally okay uh, you can certainly see certain types of inventories and this is not some artificial situation this can jolly well happen in any commodity trading in any commodity company okay you can assume that right a gold mining company will have inventories of gold okay which they have not sold right so uh, this can jolly well happen so in certain cases your statement is uh, definitely not true but it's not that it's always false because it depends on the kind of inventory you have if the inventory that you have is a very illiquid kind of product i'm trying i'm struggling to think of something maybe some some kind of in, uh, illiquid product okay which maybe doesn't uh, trade very actively okay you can't even say steel and all because steel also is very actively traded now okay coal steel you don't have very liquid markets like oil and gold and copper but they're still quite actively traded so all those will be risk books okay but if you can think of some very unusual kind of uh, maybe uh, inventory which is not actively traded that you could say is not a risk book okay so when we say risk book we are really concerned with kind of actively traded markets okay when your assets and liabilities are such that those uh, assets and liabilities are actively traded okay you can see that they are actively traded here you have this problem with the yen dollar yen also moves around quite a lot okay so you have a, if you have an exposure to dollar yen then you have a risk book here because your revenues are in dollars your revenues are in dollars and your liabilities are in yen so you have a problem okay so these are many of the reasons why so i'm just trying to give you a feel for what is a risk book later on you can read the notes in detail and try to understand and then if you read the notes and you don't understand any particular word or a line then you ask me okay you are, that's what you have to do i'm not going to go through each and every line in the notes let's just skip through and see if there's anything in particular that i need to cover so we are trying to first make you understand the difference between a risk book and why uh, what is a risk book and why we are calling uh, one an active risk book the speculators book and the passive risk book the hedgers book okay so uh, so risk book basically is a balance sheet you can think of everything as a balance sheet even when you're trading you are doing your equity trading us equity options you started with a one so you started with a, ba a balance sheet which was 100 uh, 1 million dollars of cash 
on the asset side and on the outside li on the uh, on the uh, library side what did you have no outside library it was net worth because that's money that just you didn't take a loan okay so that's uh, you money you it's like you put in the money okay so it's as if like you're a money manager and interactive brokers has capitalized you with one million dollars so you're working that's all equity please be clear that was all equity in your account and then you did something you bought some amazon put options so now your cash balance has gone down so you spent five thousand dollars buying amazon put options so then your cash balance has gone down a little bit your asset mix has changed okay so on the other side you still have if the if the value if the market price has not changed since you bought it then the uh, net worth figure will not change but now your asset side is slightly different you got an amazon put option as one of your assets and the rest is still cash okay are you following so this was again a this was also a risk book so you can it's very useful to think of a risk book always as a balance sheet okay which is continuously being updated second to second all values are being updated second to second you can think of it that way is this clear all right okay so now you have so here i've used the word risk i don't actually use this word a riskless book uh, is uh, i've used just to make a contrast with this and a risk book but in in the industry we don't use a term like this riskless book this is just make just to draw contrast between a, what is a risk book and what is not a risk book okay so where the assets and liabilities can't change in value okay or change very slowly okay so basically um i should just modify this because everything changes in value because now for instance the nuclear plants uh, there was listening to an interview of bill gates uh, he's talking about how the technology has been evolving and a lot of the existing nuclear plants in the us are so expensive i mean they they the cost of production is too high because the technology that they're trying to build a next generation plant in china so uh, the technology uh, so technological change will basically uh, affect the values of even plants and things like that plant and equipment but we don't normally uh, consider that as a risk book all right okay so now you understand okay uh, so this 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 the top top uh, the stuff about tree steel plant nuclear plant is all mentioned here okay and fairly rapid change in market uh, in uh, uh, assets and liabilities it could basically in in when you're talking about risk books we are concerned with uh, market risk and credit risk okay we are talking about things which have market risk and credit risk and which can uh, quite uh, change in value quite rapidly because of markets trading those assets okay so uh, this is what we are talking about when we are talking about a risk book okay so we want to understand um this here all right now we want to talk about active versus passive risk books okay what now active risk book by now you have understood clearly these are all active risk books if i buy, start buying some futures contracts these are active risk books these are a speculators risk book okay i started with zero risk and i actively increase my risk because i want to make money okay so i've increased my risk my first transaction will always increase my total risk that's an active risk book now what is a passive risk book why am i saying it's passive risk because passive you understand passive means i'm not really doing anything okay so but it still got risk because look at this company here it's a uh, it's a mining company mining and exploration company okay so they are not actually they, their number one goal is not really to speculate on oil prices or gold prices or copper prices if you wanted to speculate on gold and op copper prices this is a much better way of doing it you trade futures contracts you have active futures contracts because here i can get in and out uh you can see here the price has moved up by a couple of cents okay um uh if i want to speculate in gold and uh, in oil futures or uh, oil or gold or copper it's a much cleaner way to do it through futures contracts i can just get in and out in one click two click okay but if i have a gold mine okay do you think i can get in and out of that whole business in one click two click no i can't right i have to deal with unions i have to deal with government regulations environmental clearances all kinds of stuff so these guys have chosen to be in the business of mining and exploration okay so this is a very very complicated business because you have all kinds of things to manage you have to manage a supply chain plant equipment all kinds of uh, labor problems this that and then you have so these guys are not primarily interested in speculating on the prices of their uh, the materials that they are mining okay what are they doing have you heard this expression value chain when you did your m and a transactions and corporate strategy you heard the expression value chain so there's a value chain in oil as well let's say exxon mobil is my, uh, exploring 
okay deep in alaska off the uh, off the coast of alaska they are exploring they have an exploration they have an oil rig okay so, so they dig up the oil from under the uh, uh, under the ocean floor okay and they bring it to the surface then they uh, refine the oil okay and then eventually when you go to the gas station and fill up your gas tank okay that's the end of the chain are you following so it begins all the way off the sea coast off the shores of alaska where they're going into uh, the ocean floor and digging up the oil so the entire thing is a value chain all right so now what this kind of a company is in the business of is they're not in the business of speculating on oil future oil prices or copper prices because there are much more efficient ways of doing that by just trading in futures contract you have no overhead literally okay you can get in and out in a click okay so fast because your risk management is much better you have uh, you have much more control over your risk so uh, therefore what they are doing is what are they in the business of they're actually in the business of you might have heard this expression in strategy cases that they're in the business of extracting the efficiencies in the value chain and they're going to charge for it obviously if they extract the oil for let's say uh, twenty dollars a barrel okay like saudi cost of production is quite low okay saudi oil cost of production is one of the lowest in the world so if they're let's say it's supposed to be about 18 20 dollars a barrel okay so uh, now if the saudis are extracting oil eventually the net cost of bringing that oil to the refinery is 18 20 dollars a barrel okay uh, then they are not going to sell it at 18 20 dollars a barrel right they are going to sell it at maybe whatever whatever the market will bear whatever the market price is they have to sell it according to the market price are you guys following the discussion okay i'm talking quite rapidly because i'm under pressure to cover material before we finish uh, so we can start the course yes now why did he go out i thought i told him not to go out i told everybody not to go out okay so we are now now you're not supposed to go out actually i'll just make this clear when he go now nobody goes out if you go out i deduct two percent that goes against your cp marks and then eventually it spills into your end terms also if your cp is gone to zero okay with 10 times two percent you have gone to zero and cp then i'll go minus into your end terms okay so uh, we don't want anybody else going up unless there's a medical emergency somebody's feeling unwell like i uh, released somebody yesterday ritesh okay so um, so any anybody's feeling unwell then it's a different matter okay so that exception applies okay Garotra, are you feeling unwell or just bored bored you're just bored <laughs> or huh you're having a headache so you want to go home okay then if you want whatever if you are not feeling well you can go if you want to relax here you can just put your head down and just relax yeah okay all right okay so uh, what were we discussing uh, the value chain right so the point is that these companies what are they in the business of okay they are in the business of extracting the efficiencies from the value chain so saudi arabia when it's <laughs> able to bring the oil to the market uh, to the refinery at 18 20 dollars a barrel it's not going to charge 18 20 dollars a barrel it will charge something related to the market okay they can't set the price they are driven by market prices so it's almost like a perfect competition world because you have to be a price taker even though you're such a big producer okay even saudi arabia can't control the oil price okay it just there's so much speculative activity just moves up and down and they basically have to take whatever the market gives them okay the whatever the market is so when saudi is producing at 20 dollars a barrel market prices are 58 they're raking in all this margin okay so that's what they're in the business of they're in the business of extracting oil from the ground and bringing it to the refinery okay at a uh, sufficiently competitive price because they they can extract the efficiencies in the value chain so they're in the business of basically uh, delivering on that part of the value chain in the efficient way are you able to follow this logic that what are these companies doing when you see a company like exxon mobile or you see a company like vedanta resources okay uh, what are they in the business of they are not in the business of speculating on commodity prices that they could have done with futures contracts okay but they are in the business of extracting the efficiencies in the value chain and basically capturing that value for themselves yes have you understood okay from a uh, strategy point of view right so that's why however even a company like this okay uh, even say a company like magma here which we have drawn up as a artificial company uh, this because they're, they're a very similar company to say rio tinto or vedanta resources or exxon mobil okay now uh, or, or um, uh, what is it anglo-american plc all these big commodity companies so now but in the in the course of trying to extract the efficiencies from the value chain they are exposed to various risks can you see that because you can't really run a business of mining gold and then say i don't want to have any inventory at all 
it's not practical okay if you're running a gold mine you're going to have some inventory sitting on the books because you can't just as soon as it gets mined uh, you can't just immediately close a sale because the prices may not be right all kinds of, are you following this point yes. that when you're running a business you're producing something you can't afford to you can't expect to run a zero inventory position okay uh, so you will have some kind of inventory going on at, uh, you know at all different points of time so therefore what is happening in this case is as you've already seen that there is a risk to this book okay there is a this is a risk book because oil they will have some inventory they will always be carrying some amount of inventory okay so uh, therefore and these because these things are markets where uh, prices can move around quite rapidly so if the prices of these as any of these assets drops they will suffer a loss are you following this they will suffer a loss okay so they are exposed to this risk now they didn't really want to speculate on um, commodity prices but because they are actually trying because of the kind of business they are in they are exposed to these risks okay right is this clear okay so now they have taken some funding also this is also because they have taken they saw cheap funding in yen and aussie so they have taken it so these kinds of uh, things have uh, these are also part of you can't run a business without taking some loans okay and then you might have some other considerations for taking cheaper uh, lower interest rate loans although there is a currency mismatch okay there is an asset liability mismatch so all of these reasons so these are all the aspects of running a business not everybody is able to run a perfectly matched book okay asset liabilities so businesses in 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 their natural form businesses always will carry some risks which are basically which they don't really primarily want to do but that's inevitable as a result of their risk that's why i'm calling this a passive risk book so you understand a hedger's book is actually a passive risk book okay so they're not in the business of speculating on this so they're not like active risk book like a speculator they didn't choose to do this but they're in this business and as a result of being in the business a secondary effect they are now exposed to the prices of these commodities and these currencies and things like that is this clear to everyone what we mean by a passive risk book so the passive risk book belongs to the hedger the active risk belongs to the speculator you've already understood the thing so now you see that there you have this business which is really is a mining and exploration company they are trying to extract the efficiencies because of the financing requirements they have ended up taking some currency risk as well okay so now you have now you have an understanding of what is an active risk book and a passive risk book so this is a passive risk book okay so now we come back to the first question which is what are the key risk factors okay what are the key risk factors the first question the ceo is asking okay so all this is defined in your notes let's go here yeah there will be yeah key risk factors the sequence is a little different okay so you can read this a little bit while i rest my voice i anyway have a tendency to shout and on top of that my mic has not uh, conked out so i'm shouting even more so please risk uh, read what is a key risk factor then i'll explain it briefly where is the mic i might as well use that other mic because i tend to shout so much that my throat will go for a toss okay so this includes the use of the term underlying position we'll come to that okay um So the definition is clear. You see the ingredients of the definition. It's like a section in a uh, in legislation. Okay, a key risk factor is a price and changes in that price. Price means obviously there is a market, and a market means there are two assets. So all these concepts should come back to you clearly. That's why you know it's important to understand the basics because everything builds on the previous material, and everything is always consistent. So if I've defined a market as a venue for exchanging assets, and usually you'll be exchanging one asset for another, so there are two assets. So every time I use the word market, that meaning will always remain the same. It will always involve two assets. Okay. So price means price is always for some base asset, or sometimes a terms asset. Okay, depending on how you ask for the quote. So there is a price. Um, yeah. So price. You see the key elements of the definition here is a price. Okay. 
then price obviously means automatically implies a market all right and changes in that price are going to cause changes in the value of assets and liabilities and you can further extend this remember what we decided what is our uh, formula that net worth is uh, net worth is equal to total assets minus outside liabilities okay so if as a result of these changes in the value of assets and liabilities you'll have uh, the if the total assets value drops or the outside liabilities value rises then your net worth will decrease which is basically like the result of a loss okay so therefore that's on, when we are talking about risk we always think of risk only on the downside okay we don't think of risk in the classical finance way of uh, standard deviation which is symmetrical on both sides okay because i think that's a kind of stupid way of looking at risk so the common sense way of looking at risk is basically that to see it as the downside problem when you're making money there's no risk okay all right so uh, so is this clear now okay a key risk factor now we'll understand this is just the theoretical definition now we'll understand how to apply it to the balance sheet okay uh, the concept is clear it's a price okay yeah 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 okay cool. all right okay so uh, one minute okay guys let's concentrate so you've seen the definition now let's let's practice this on our own okay let's practice this on our own now who's going to tell me yash is starting to uh, tail off what happened you're also not feeling well yes you want to leave no, no, sir. okay so why don't you energize you want to go okay now you want to energize yourself by trying to tell us what are the key risk factors on this balance sheet start from the asset side is my question clear we have discussed the definition of the key risk factor the theoretical definition it's a price which means it relates to a market okay a uh, market will always have two assets all right and it's a price what kind of price is it it's a price when it changes when that price changes it will cause changes in the value of assets and liabilities which as you know further extending the argument can in certain situations lead to a reduction in lead to a reduction in net worth which is a problem all right so um, based on that theoretical understanding yash is going to tell us what on the let's say start with the asset side what key risk factors do you see this is the first question that the ceo is asking the you want to answer yeah one sec let's first deal with him so is the question clear the question is clear on the asset side uh, based on what we have discussed about the theoretical definition of key risk factors what are the key risk factors that you see on the asset side yes sir wti oil wti oil is one risk factor okay anything else <coughs> Only oil is a risk factor so far for you. Okay, what is Tarun saying? Okay, yeah. So we don't say decrease in the price. The way we describe a risk factor is basically we say the oil price, the WTI oil price, because you could also have Brent oil price or Arab Light or all kinds of various flavors. Okay, there's a Mexican crude cocktail also, and what the what the Mexicans produce. Okay, so WTI oil is a particular grade of oil, West Texas Intermediate, which is the North American crude oil benchmark. Okay, so the risk factors on the asset side here will be because remember it's a price, it's a price which is discovered in a market or traded in a market. So the market so here is basically basically is the oil price. Okay, West Texas WTI oil price, the copper price, and the gold price. On the asset side, these are our risk factors. This is clear. Yes, everyone is clear about this. These are the key risk factors. Okay, on the liability side, what will we describe as the key risk factors? Yes, who's going to tell us, Burma? Yes, sir. Instead of talking to Gulati, why don't you tell us what is uh, what are the risk key risk factors on the? We refer to them as KRFs. Okay, we'll just call them KRFs. Tell us what are the KRFs. Uh, uh, Tarun has already, uh, Yash and Tarun have already told you the KRFs on the asset side. Now tell us the KRFs on the uh, liability side. The change in the price of. Uh, no, we don't say change in the price. We say price because we have already defined KRF as something as a price. We have defined it as a price, which if it changes will affect the values of assets and liabilities. So we can just refer to the KRF as a price of 
maybe uh, whatever you know uh, price of iPhones or whatever okay something like that so you don't say change in price of iPhones you say price of iPhones is a risk factor yeah so what are the KRFs on the liability side so price of uh, yen and Aussie dollar okay so in and what are the terms assets okay so in the yen in the case of the yen what market are because when you are referring to a price you should also clarify the market that means you have to if you want to clarify the market you have to clarify both the assets right because just saying gold market gold is traded in terms of uh, many many I mean actually it's just traded actively in terms of US dollars so we understood that as being a US dollar traded market but in general when the conventions are not so clear you have to sometimes uh, clarify that both the assets so in the case of the yen what are the two assets so JPY USD. okay all right so the JPY USD exchange rate becomes one risk factor okay on the liability side one of the key fa key risk factors is the JPY because then once you identify the key risk factors as a risk manager as a treasury risk manager you are going to focus your eyes will be totally glued to those risk factors you're going to be tracking those risk factors and trying to analyze what is the risk here and what is the risk is it going to go against me or is it going to move in my favor which means you'll have to continuously analyze continuously look at the charts and analyze this and come up with a view because that's what you'll have to implement in your trading project when you're managing the hedge book <coughs> when you're managing the hedge position that those decisions that you take to buy or sell okay at the timing of those decisions okay will be totally based on your view on the KRFs are you following that is the connection to the project why does it why is it important to understand the moment you look at a risk book why is it important to identify quickly the KRFs because that's where your focus is going to be these are the prices which if they move around they can affect the values of my assets and liabilities so they can effectively may uh, you know cause me to experience a loss so therefore I have to have a very clear view on where these assets are where these market prices are headed so when I look at the dollar yen I need to have a very clear view is this thing going up or down because that will affect my decision all right that will affect what I do on the hedge book uh, 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 with respect to the hedge book all right this is clear the first point is uh, the first risk factor KRF that you identified on the liability side is the dollar yen rate the dollar yen exchange rate okay in this case they have uh, because we are going to be trading notice one more thing here while we're discussing the yen notice the difference between let me bring this here all right now notice the difference between the two yen prices both of these are prices for the same market the last two rows both of these are prices for the same market the last row is a spot dollar yen now you remember your matrix asset classes markets and instruments yes, so now you are in the currency row and inside the currency row you are in a particular market which is dollar yen okay there could be lots of other markets nc2 right then uh, in that dollar yen then again dollar yen the dollar yen market could be traded in, in the form of futures it could be traded in the form of options swaps uh, spot forwards value cash all kinds of things okay here you see two of those prices this is a spot dollar yen price the last row is a spot dollar yen price and this is a yen futures price okay in both cases the market is the same but why is there a difference in the numbers base asset and terms asset in the case of the futures contract if you go and open your uh, we have a futures note for you uh, here if you go and open the yen futures contract um, page you will find that the yen uh, trades Japanese yen futures contract contract specs when you open the contract specs you'll see that the CME currency futures contracts are all structured in such a way that the US dollar is always going to be the terms asset okay this is for the convenience of US customers because it mainly caters to US customers of course now they have customers around the world but when they started they were mainly catering to US customers to make it easy for them to trade currency futures they have priced all currency uh, contracts they have structured all currency contracts in such a way what is the contract unit 12 and a half million yen can you see that so in this market when you're trading currency futures SG1 why did you go out you're not supposed to go out 
Now, this is the last time I'm letting Brahmadi go. Otherwise, every time you go out, I'll deduct two uh, percent. Okay. So everything should be taken care of. You have a 15-minute break in between classes, so you take care of all your uh, requirements in that period. Get your water bottle filled and everything. Okay. All right, guys. So now understand contract. Why is it so important to read contract specs for any futures contract that you're trading? Why is it so important to read contract specs? Because you need to know exactly what you're trading. In this case, currency futures that you're going to use for this project. Now, although this segment of the market is actually more liquid, the spot dollar yen market is more liquid than the futures market. But the futures market not too bad either. As you can see here, prices are quite tight. Okay, but uh, this is still much more liquid. But because the uh, accounting for these spot positions is not very good in the case of IB, so therefore I'm forcing you guys to trade in futures contract, which is also a good thing because you get to learn about these because these futures contracts are also reasonably liquid so you get to learn about the currency futures contracts okay so the amount of the exposure as you you will notice has been structured in such a way that uh, the total amount of the yen loan is a round multiple of the uh, yen futures contract so should any team decide to go to 100% hedged on the dollar yen okay uh, they can do that because it's a round multiple of the yen futures contract size. So is this clear now? You suddenly change the, the terms asset because you've defined the futures contract in this way. So that's why it's important to understand the futures contract specs. Okay. So next, uh, who will tell us? Gulati, you want to tell us? Any other uh, KRF you want to identify on the liability side? Burma has already identified one. So Aussie USD. Aussie USD. Very good. So Aussie USD exchange rate, another risk factor. Okay. What is happening? Yes. Yeah. One more. Yes. In this case, it's Aussie USD because what is the rate here? How is it quoted here? You can see if we can actually bring up here. Uh, I think hopefully this will come. All right. Now let's let's take both of these together. Okay, let's put it here. Okay, all right, guys. Now we've got all these things together. Okay, we've got the yen future, uh, we got the Aussie futures contract, and we got the Aussie spot both together. Is there any difference in the price quotation? I mean, there's a small difference because these two are not for the same. Remember, futures contracts. The maturity, let's look at the futures contract maturity. It will be the same, I think, for Aussie and Yen. We don't need to open an, uh, another uh, contract page. Okay. This, uh, are they the, both the same month? You have to see. Remember, for futures contracts, you have to also be clear. Okay. Yeah, you can see it here. We don't have to go there. The, this Aussie futures contract, the Yen futures contract, these are for, remember, futures contracts are all for different maturities. When you look at a futures strip, when you look at a future strip, remember when we looked at future strips, this this is called a future strip. Like if you look at this, um, if you go to energy, now we, we don't need to go through this uh, you know convoluted route. We can go from your uh, futures here. Uh, let's go to um, crude oil. Here you see what is a few. Have you heard this term before? The future strip, like a strip of band-aid or whatever, strip of plaster or whatever. So now let's look at this. This is called a future strip, okay? Which is basically a, a, a complete list of futures prices. Here you can see it very well in the case of oil because it trades so far out. You'll see oil prices about five years, six years out, okay? This is called a future strip, which is basically all your uh, oil prices, all oil futures contracts together. Okay, I can't, uh, you know, I, I need to reduce the size of this thing to give you, uh, let you see more, but you can go down further and see it starts with Jan 20, 20 uh, Jan 2020, then Feb 2020, March, etc. So this, uh, when you, whenever you see a display of futures prices for different maturities, okay, that's called a future strip, okay. So it's like a strip of, uh, you know, uh, like a tape or whatever. Okay, so this is called a future strip. So remember that futures contracts, spot contracts have only one maturity. Okay, so when you say I want to trade dollar yen spot, everybody will understand that you're trading today to two business days. Today is the transaction date. Settlement date will be two clear business days. Both Tokyo and New York must be holiday uh, must be working days. 
so you need to give both tokyo and uh, if there's a holiday in tokyo then it will shift forward into one more day so you need to give two clear business days in both the centers so if you're trading dollar yen two clear business days in new york and tokyo that's your spot settlement so settlement date will be two days two business days later in the case of spot okay but in the case of futures you can see there's always a future strip so you need to be clear about what maturity futures contract are you trading so you have an additional decision problem in the case of futures you need to specify the decision problem in the uh, uh, sorry you need to specify the majority of the contract when you're trading spot you don't have to specify because there's only one maturity there's a standard maturity are you following the distinction the moment you trade futures your ears should perk up that you have one more problem to solve whenever you're trading options you also have the same problem you need to decide what tenor of option do you want to buy or sell okay that's a decision problem separate decision problem same with futures and typically i would suggest that we haven't even come to the discussion of open interest but this problem for the sake of your for the purposes of your project you are going to solve by focusing on the volume go to the cme page pick the contract with the highest volume and trade that okay provided of course in, in real life you have to make sure that if suppose this were contract if the may contract had uh, you know i mean if if the jan contract had the highest volume but you're trying to hedge exposure for may the jan contract will expire before your exposure comes due okay so we'll get into that discussion later on but uh, is everyone clear about this that when you're trading futures contracts you have to talk about which maturity also you have to specify which futures contract are you trading so here what are we trading here what are we trading so data connection is very poor um, okay guys here look at this both the yen and the aussie futures contracts 16th december 2019 the settlement date the settlement date for these two contracts is december 16th 2019 and what will be the spot settlement for today today is what is today thursday yes sir. Uh, okay so if there are no holidays in new york and tokyo if i do a deal today this will settle monday okay so monday is what is monday going to be what date whatever ninth okay so ninth december so there is a slight difference in the price you'll notice very small difference you notice that difference because there is a difference between settling on 9th of december and and settling on 16th of december are you able to follow this okay if i if i promise you some uh, uh, if i promise to repay you some money on 16th of december and i ask you to lend me the money today versus if somebody else is promising you the repayment on 9th of december and asking for money today you will give the second person more money because the present value when you discount it is is low is higher in the case of the 9th december maturity is this clear whenever you change change the settlement date remember transactions market every market is a venue for exchanging assets transaction is a contract to exchange assets that means you automatically have the concept and then you have a contract that we have to discharge your obligations under the contract right you're going to contract law now and then discharging of obligation means essentially delivering the asset that you sold receiving the asset that you bought that is the settlement settlement date can be different from transaction date so whenever you have two different settlement dates the price you would expect it to differ because if some, as the example that i gave you if a cash flow is coming to you on 16 december the present value of that is lower than a cash flow coming to you on 9th, 9th of december yes you agree yes Pulkit, are you following yes, sir. okay so prices are slightly different okay uh, because the difference in time is not that much but do you see any difference coming back to gulati uh, do you see any difference in the manner of the quotation in the aussie futures contract quote in, in the in the case of the yen we saw a difference right in the case of the yen let's wipe out all these fellows facebook and all we don't need them right now okay we'll we'll add them if we need them okay so now let's insert some so that we can actually have Oh, what did I do? Okay, I need to. I I thought I was pressing insert. I can't see anything here. That's the problem. All right. Okay. Right. So maybe I don't know where I just. Where, okay. I think the insert is here. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we can see it very clearly. All right. Now you can see. In the case of the yen futures, there's a difference in the display, because in the case of the futures contract the us dollar is the terms asset okay but in the case and and so all futures contracts in the U, uh, on the cme 
Okay, all currency futures contracts on the CME, the US dollar is the term's asset. But in the case of the Aussie, there's no difference because in the spot market also, when you trade Aussie in the spot market, Aussie is the base asset and the dollar is the term's asset. So there's no difference. Are you following? Is everyone following? Yes, Some people are dozing off in the corner, others will get very early on to doze off, first period. Okay. Don't uh, just just bear with us for just less than less than three minutes left. Okay, is everyone following so far? <coughs> yes. Okay. All right. So second point has been identified by Gulati. Any third? Let's identify. So we are already solving the first question in the case. All the key risk factors. Now there's something else you don't know. Let me go back to the case. There's something else you don't know. Here. The US dollar loan, you see there is a small US dollar loan. Now what does it say? The US dollar loan, look at this. Point number five, question number five actually. To identify the risk factors, you need to understand this information. Uh, you need to be given this information. The US dollar loan has a five year maturity, but the loan is interest to uh, index to three month LIBOR. Three month LIBOR, you guys are familiar with LIBOR? LIBOR is a floating interest rate. If you have a five-year loan and your interest rate can change every three months, this is what it means. Okay, this is please understand floating interest rate. This is our last concept for today. Okay, last concept for today. Make sure you understand this risk factor. You have another risk factor here, which is three-month LIBOR. Okay, on the dollar loan, there is no currency risk because assets are in dollars, liabilities are in dollars on the dollar loan. But there is a different kind of risk different asset class we went through commodities on the asset side we went through currencies on the liability side now we got another problem on the asset side that relates to debt or interest rates because now here you have a second uh, you have another risk factor which is three month libor three month libor is an interest rate which is fixed every every day actually every day for the next three months every day there's a fixing in libor you can read i've given you the link please make sure you understand all this what is libor these are all your readings okay all this knowledge you can demonstrate in your interviews or anywhere else you have a conversation okay so this is also an additional risk factor because if three month LIBOR starts rising rapidly you have five years to repay the loan okay it's a bullet repayment every three months your interest rate is changing okay if that change is moving against you every three months rates are going up rapidly then you're going to have a problem because your interest liability is not fixed it is floating. This is the difference between floating rate loans and fixed rate loans. Okay, in a floating rate loan, essentially what is happening is the reset. The interest rate is being reset at a period at a pre, at a frequency which is much smaller, as much shorter than the total tenor of the loan. The tenor of the loan is five years. The reset frequency is three months. So you don't any have any clarity beyond the first three months when you take the loan. When you take the loan, you only know your rate for the first three months next three months rate you'll know only after three months <coughs> your interest period of three months to six months what is going to be paid that you get to know only after three months is everyone clear about this yes, okay this is what is mean this is what is meant by okay i'll let you go since we are putting okay now you can go now the time is up i've already taken 30 seconds extra okay since you are being forced to uh, take care of all your business in the break so you should get a full break did you guys follow what was going on okay you and Gulati was all, we managed to keep you awake we have to give him a special coffee yeah yeah yeah, yeah. use the mic we're going to record it yeah yeah just hold on use the mic your voice, your voice is not coming through the mic you have to practice that also yeah yeah in the first case usd jp yeah no yeah well technically you should write this in the case because we are going to manage it in the uh, using although i have used a different rate i've used the dollar yen rate it's not consistent with the currency futures so i've used the dollar yen rate so we'll understand it with a view of dollar yen because uh, dollar yen is more actively traded the spot dollar yen so actually this rate should be inverted strictly speaking i haven't done it because uh, i will earlier we used to do this project using spot 
so I have not reformatted because if I change this, I will change the formula. Okay. So what is your question? Let validity law on the USD is the second case. Like in the first round, they can. Yeah, because there are two loans. There are three loans actually, but there are two foreign currency loans, right? One foreign currency loan is yen. That you have understood. The Aussie part you haven't understood. Okay. Why Gulati's answer is correct. Okay. So in the case of the Aussie, you were there yesterday. We did this exercise. This is a key risk factor. The answer is with respect to the question of what are the key risk factors? Why is? Uh, yeah, uh, I want to uh, know that why are we taking the base, uh, the base asset as um, uh, Aussie, and in the first case we are taking it as uh, USD. Okay. Uh, yeah, because uh, see, this is the convention. This is this is just a matter of convention that in the international markets, uh, whether you trade main, mainly the markets are in spot. Okay, the most liquid markets are in spot. So the convention. This is just a matter of convention. Like it's like asking, why do we drive in India? Why do we drive on the left-hand side of the road? And in the U.S., why do they drive on the right-hand side of the road? There is no scientific explanation for this. That you know, if you boil water, if you apply heat to a beaker of water, it will boil. So it's boil. There is no scientific explanation. It's just a convention. Why do they use meters and why do we use uh, feet? What would be different? Yeah, the rate would be different. See, if you wanted to quote this, now the convention in both cases, as you can see, in both in in the case, see, in the in the case of both uh, futures contracts and spot, okay, in the case of the Aussie US, both are quoted with the Aussie as the base asset and US dollar as terms asset. Okay, you're saying that if we change this around and we quote it with the US dollar as base asset, the rate will change. Yeah, obviously. So this will become basically one by uh, this rate will become if we put it here. Okay, this rate will become one by that will be your rate. So one US dollar buys so many Aussie, right? That will be your rate. That will be your rate. Okay, if you change it around, but that's not the convention. Okay, so the convention in the spot markets, which are the most active segment of the currency markets, is uh, to quote it with the Aussie as the base asset. Just like Euro, USD, FX rate. Okay, then cable, GBP is the base asset. Kiwi, if you trade Kiwi, Kiwi is the base asset, not US dollars. It's just a convention. Okay, is this clear? So that's why. Yeah. See the the the, the way it, it works. See, there is a consistency in the futures markets. In the CME futures contracts, they they are all structured to make the US dollar all of the terms asset that is how that is consistent across all CME currency futures contracts okay they have contracts on sterling also and Swiss franc also you can see that okay all will be consistent everything the US dollar is going to be the terms asset okay but in the case of the spot market the conventions are not uniform like if you go here if you add this okay you can see the differences in the spot market what happened? It's not coming up. Oh, it came on top. I didn't see that. What happened? Reason? <laughs> it's not coming. Oh, it's come on top. Okay. Okay, it's come on top. Why is it coming on top? Okay. So the point is if you see this if you bring it down here so both came down. yeah so if you see this in the spot market in the spot FX markets because they are OTC markets so if they have developed according to their own rules and it's not uniform so you can see in in the case of the euro dollar FX in the case of the cable in the case of the Aussie okay the convention is to have the US dollar as terms asset but in the case of dollar yen the convention is to have the dollar as the uh, base asset. This is clear. This is just a matter of convention. So the conventions in the in the OTC FX markets are not uniform, but in the futures markets they are the same. Uh, there is a uh, there is a uniform uh, convention. That's all. This is this clear?
Okay, yeah. What is your question? Use the phone. Is that what? It's an administrative question. Then. Okay, okay. Use the mic. I can't hear you. Use the mic. What is novation assignment? What? Oh, novation and assignment. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You had a what exam? Net. In what? In management. There is a net in management. Yes. Okay, okay. So in financial management, there was this question. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So novation is yeah. So novation is good that you are reading all this. So let's where should we put it basically? Where is your notes? So let's write novation. How much time do we have? Next teacher will come in. No, it's upstairs. We don't have a class. Okay. Novation is basically uh, novation comes from new, nova new. Okay, like Lenovo. Lenovo means the new. Okay, novo is new basically. Novation comes from that word. Okay, that's the origin. Creation of it's basically these are contract law terms. Okay, these are contract law terms. I also have to give my law net, but I'm not going to do it right now. I want to get some time to prepare. Okay, contract law novation creation of a new uh, of a new contract. Okay. Okay. Usually aggregating obligations from several pre existing contracts. So okay, so so often used for netting used for um, risk reduction through although I don't think the net people will know all this but uh, the I don't know what the net answer for your question is but I'm just giving you the markets answer okay risk reduction often used for risk reduction through um, netting through is not a bad good word via via netting uh, between OTC counterparties okay this is your what does this mean creation of, let's say that you and I are different banks so we are trading actively between ourselves okay so we have thousands of trades between ourselves in sterling and uh, in cable in euro etc okay so just on the and on that on the basis of that we may actually aggregate across contracts okay we may find that I have to pay you some hundred billion dollars okay if we are taking on a gross basis you take each contract well each contract is different technically okay so if I have sold you say uh, if I have so if I have bought say 100 million cable from you so I will get 100 million sterling and you will get the equivalent dollars so, I will, so every transaction is separately settled and separately the gross payments have to go but instead of doing that since we have thousands of contracts just let's take the example of cable okay so what we'll do is we will look at what are the contracts we will look at who is losing money under each of the contracts okay so we will so you may losing you may be losing some let's say seven million dollars net on all your contracts and I may be losing let's say uh, 13 million dollars okay net on all the contracts so then I owe you six million dollars okay so what will happen is now I will pay you six million dollars okay and we will come up with a so these are thousands of contracts now instead of thousands of contracts will come up with a new contract because we'll use current market prices okay we'll have a new contract where let's say I am long say uh, 50 million sterling or something like that okay and you are short that equivalent amount of so, so the, now we have reduced the total exposure because we don't have to make those huge gross payments anymore okay so we have reduced that so this is how counterparties in the OTC markets will reduce their risk because if I have to pay you hundreds of billions of dollars I have a risk on all those amounts that I may give the money to you but you may not pay your part you may not deliver your amount depending on where time zone which way where you are located right that's a exchange traded product that's a different situation but in pure OTC situations pure OTC you and I have to manage the risk as of, as counterparties okay so one of the ways you do it is so novation is basically novation is new 
right? So what we have done is we have taken thousands of old contracts. We have made a settlement between ourselves based on valuation, mark to market. Now we have come up with a new contract. Now we have come up with a new contract, okay? Which uh, open leke ja rahe usko. Ye mujhe de dijiye. Main mic mein mic mein baat kar raha hu. Ye wala ye. Ye to khatam ho gaya this. Yeah, I'll just use it for mic. Okay. So in the case of because it's very noisy also, right? So this is this is called netting by innovation. Okay. Where innovation is basically remember that comes from the new. So innovation happens because we created a new contract. Okay, but it's this new contract is not the result of some new thinking on your part or my part. This new contract is only a replacement for all those thousands of old contracts. Okay, so this is called netting. So it's like innovation. Why new? Nova new because you created a new contract to basically aggregate the obligations of thousands of old contracts. Okay, this is what is called innovation. So here's an example, a real life example of innovation. We have netting by innovation between OTC counterparties. They they are thereby able to reduce their risk. Okay, that's one. So now you're clear about innovation. But on Google, it is written that we transfer the rights and obligations to the third party. Not necessarily always true. You can actually subscribe. You can, but then you have to make some kind of payments depending on the mark to market value of the existing contracts. Okay, so that's why Google is not the right way to understand. But first understand. And it's a simpler situation to understand it between two parties. You understood between two parties. You can actually have this kind of a production. This is like a. Uh, it's also called portfolio. It's also called portfolio compression. Okay, where you have taken your total portfolio and compressed the portfolio. Okay, it's also called. So the same. If you bring in a third party, that third party, if there is any mark-to-market payment to be made, okay, depending on the rate on the new contract, you have to settle that. But it's easier to understand between two parties. You can understand the economics of it. The main idea is to reduce. The main idea in innovation is a new contract, not because of any new thinking, but to replace a bunch of existing contracts. That is called innovation. Reduce risk. Yeah, to reduce risk. Usually, it is used to reduce risk. Now, assignment. Okay, assignment is basically. Remember, there is a concept of privity of contract. You understand privity of contract? Privity of contract means that if there is a contract between you and Garvit, okay, then I can't, and Garvit will have some obligations under the contract. Now I can't come in from somewhere and force Garvit to perform the obligations under the contract with you. Only you can force him because his obligation is only to you. I have no business to butt my head in and say that you must perform. If he's not performing the contract. Obligations and you are not bothered. Okay, then I can't come in and make him perform. This is called privity of contract. Okay, so there's a famous case called uh, Dunlop versus Selfridge. Okay, so Dunlop had a Dunlop tire maker. So they had an agreement with their wholesaler that you will not discount the price. Okay, but the wholesaler sold the tires to Selfridge, and Selfridge started discounting. So Dunlop sued Selfridge, saying, "Why are you discounting?" So then Selfridge said. You can't sue me because your contract is with the wholesaler. You can sue the wholesaler, but I am not a party to your contract. So that's called privity of contract. Okay, so that limits the ability. Third party intervention is not allowed generally. Okay, there are some exceptions where there is a concept of a third party beneficiary and all that. You saw that. Remember the case where you had uh, this privity of contract defense came up in Dutton versus Pool. Remember we did that case where that lady. Uh, The, she left all her lands to the niece, and then the niece was not paying the uncle. Yes. So when the uncle sued the niece, the the niece said that privity of contract. I am no, I have no contractual obligation. She is keeping under all kinds of defenses, no consideration and all that. Okay. But one of those are privity of contract defense. That my contract is with my aunt, not with you. Yes. You can't sue. But actually, there is an exception for in this case, the uncle can sue because he was a third party beneficiary. So there was actually consideration, okay, which moves. So this uh, is connected to the idea of consideration also. So this assignment concept is connected to the idea of privity of contract. Okay. Now what can happen is, you now Garvit can say to you that I am transferring my obligation. Suppose he had to construct some building for you. So what he will say is, I am transferring my obligations to Mega. Now. Whatever I was supposed to doing under the, do under the contract, now Mega will do that under the contract. So he has assigned his contractual obligations to her. Okay. So now, if you want to sue, you sue her, not him. 
Okay, so he has to also enter into an agreement with her to basically compensate her for if she, if she feels that compensation is not adequate or whatever. So basically, what is this assignment essentially means that you're transferring your contractual obligations to a third party who was not an original party to the contract. So it's connected to the idea of privity of contract. You should also, when you understand assignment, you should also understand privity of contract. So assignment privity of contract. So I'm not going to write this. Is that okay? You'll understand. You can listen to the video once again and understand. These are important contract uh, principles of contract law okay privity of contract you can read that case also if you want Dunrock versus Selfridge but assignment essentially is basically transfer of obligations transfer of contracts I can write this transfer of contractual obligations this is transfer of obligation and rights uh, no obligation you see it's like assets and liabilities my obligation is your right if you are party to the contract my obligation is your right your obligation is my right yes. just like when I lend you money my asset is your liability okay yes, so both are there we'll, we'll see what the difference are let's just first right transfer of contractual obligations to to third party so by third party we mean uh, third party not originally part of the contract so this part I'm not writing you remember this yes. yeah this yeah this is what it means assignment is basically transfer of your contractual obligation because ordinarily the house is not built you would have sued Garvit but now he has assigned the contractual obligations to her so you will have to sue her now okay so it's clear so uh, both the concepts are clear okay no novation you can understand it through the example of netting by novation novation basically comes from the word new that is the clue and, but new not because of any new need but new really to replace the old that's the idea so these questions are coming to in, in the management net yes sir because they don't teach all this stuff in yes, management. This is a contract law concepts. Yes, These are both there contract law. Any question which were not obviously taught to us, and but like they were there, so I have to do it. Okay, okay. Know. So you're picking up a like a law net book. I mean a, a management net guidebook or something. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. Good. Later on, I have to pick up a law net guidebook. So where did you buy this stuff? I will also have to buy it later on. Delhi University. You can get from Patel Chess. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Fine. Any other question? Okay. Good. So we. Close it now.